James, welcome to Heaven Above Water podcast, mate. Lauren, thanks so much for having me. It's amazing in here. It's amazing. I have been so excited to get you on this show, um, mainly because I remember the first time we ever met and I heard you talk. Mm. And in the first 20 minutes of you talking, I thought, this guy is something special. You Thank taught you. me more in 20 minutes of me hearing you talk <laughs> than any psychologist I'd ever worked with in about 20 years. That's the good stuff. That's, yeah. that's what we want. And Thank in you. the setting that I work in, sport, high performance and all that, I've, I've seen my fair share of psychologists in my time as psychiatrist. So, mm. And I remember when I was listening to you talk, and I remember thinking, this guy is so relatable. Like... I can relate to him in a way that I've never been able to relate to any psychologist or professional. And you taught me more about how my brain works and I guess how I can train that. And it felt like a really tangible way for me to improve my performance. Mm. And so then I think when I heard you, you were doing this book, and we'll come on to your book in a little bit, but when I heard you doing this book, I just thought this is going to be absolute gold dust because you get to teach everybody yeah. else what you have been teaching me, I guess, through what we've been doing yeah, uh, yeah. over the years. But... Before we get into your book, I just want to talk a little bit about you and how, I guess, how you came to speak to me here today and, uh, yeah, your background and a little bit about yourself. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, um, I mean, it's been a crazy journey. We were saying when I first walked in that we first started speaking like three years ago and that only seems like yesterday. But <laughs> so um, I joined the army in 2006. I joined the um, British Airborne Forces and I wound up doing about 14 years. So I did about 12 years in the regulars mm -hmm. in a, a unit called 7 Power RHA. And then I did two years in the reserves with 4 Para, so 4th Battalion Parachute Regiment. Um, but when I actually left the British Army, I was second in command of the British Army's mental resilience training. Um, so I was delivering mental resilience sort of all around the country, but focusing in the South. Um, and that's kind of where we first met. Now, before I was doing that, I was um, a parachuting instructor, but I was part of like the British Army's sort of first tactical parachuting instructors platoon known as the APJIs. And um, I was asked to go and do that because of the work I've been doing whilst I was in my regiment in Colchester doing strength conditioning coach with Colchester Rugby Club, who had just promoted International League Rugby, which is a high standard of rugby. It's like the top 5% rugby in the country. And I was teaching these guys how to bench press and deadlift and squat. And some of these guys had, had they'd like never been in a gym before. Mm. And what I found actually was that it was so much more than bench press, deadlifting and squatting. It was mm. talking about their mindset and it was talking about training and consistency and nutrition and what it meant to them and why they were doing what they were doing. So learning so much about coaching and mentoring is what kind of made the brigade pick me along with seven other guys to go and be these instructors, this brand new parachute instructors platoon. And whilst I was there, I realized that there was such a huge amount that we could take from training soldiers and athletes. Mm. So like the young guys at Colchester Rugby Club faced the same anxieties, pressures, stresses that young paratroopers did. And, you know, the first time they're, they're getting on board an aircraft, they're being asked to jump out of it. Mm. And so I was noticing that there's a huge amount with the psychology of performance with an athlete as with a soldier. Mm. And that kind of led me to the idea of resilience, which is I kind of wrote off to army headquarters saying, I think we do mental health wrong. We should be doing like preventative measures, not reactive measures. I'd had difficulties with my mental health and I'm very open about that. You know, I, I come from a very, very difficult childhood and, 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 you know, a dad who went to prison, who was like so incredibly abusive. And, you know, I, I had real difficulties and, 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 and had, you know, real poverty and join the army as an escape. And so I had that background, um, lots and lots and lots of like really severe physical abuse and joined the army and, and sort of went through this and noticed that if we could deliberately develop these key psychological skills for the development of emotional resilience, then like that's a massive win. We teach people rather than waiting until somebody's really ill and then they're removed from work and they have to go through the army mental health system. Why are we not talking about preventative measures? So I kind of wrote this email to army headquarters saying, listen, I've been working with athletes, I've been working with these soldiers, and this is the correlation that I've noticed. Mm -hmm. And I think we could be doing preventative measures. And that's what kind of dragged me over into the army mental health team, delivering army mental resilience. And then from there, we were having this conversation and, I'm, and I, I remember leaving and, um, the army and, and delivering to you in, uh, it was just outside of Reading uh, and the Paralympic team in that. And it was just amazing. And, and, and I delivered this, this, this is like, my development. This is my idea of what resilience look, look, looks like. And, you know, I used mind, M-I-N-D, with you mm -hmm. three years yeah. ago and and using that M-I-N-D process for the development of, of resilience. And then, you know, it, it just grew legs from there, really, you know. And, and so you and I have obviously stayed in, in, in comms and, when you know, we had sessions and, and discussions and chats, you know, before Tokyo. And, 
and it was just amazing. You know, mm. it was just amazing the 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 need and the application for resilience and what I found. And it's not just your high performing athletes and your high performing soldiers. Resilience is applicable to everybody. And the more I work in resilience, the more I learn about it. Mm. I kind of went for this thing that we observe in, in psychology, well, in, in all aspects of the world, really, called Dunning-Kruger effect, which is where you learn a little bit and you become really confident. Because yeah. I know this. And then the more you learn, the more you realise you don't learn. And you'll yeah. never have that level of confidence that you originally had. Yeah. Cause, and every time I deliver resilience to a group of people, someone's got a different perspective. Mm. Some Someone's got something that's quite challenging. So like in your introduction, you talk about how relatable you make it but so many psychologists and psychiatrists and people in mental health forget the golden rule, which is every individual that you meet is the exception to the rule. Mm. Every single human being is nuanced and subjective and different. And to say this is what resilience is and this is what you have to do mm. simply doesn't work. That's not how it is. Like human beings are different. So so when you get to that that point where you can you can explain to people about, well, actually, what's your situation and how does that look like? Mm. Then we can apply like my mind process, my M-I-N-D process to them and, and what it is that they need to achieve in their life. Yeah. And for those that don't know what M-I-N-D is, can you explain that a little bit more and what that is? Yeah, sure. So the M is, is, is measurable success. Now, I'm not a huge fan of goal setting per se, at least not the traditional sense of goal setting where we have like the smart principle, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time-bound, cool, Blech. like <laughs> amazing. How many times you heard that? People are just being sick in their mouth straight away. But like we, we, we hammer that, but I don't, I'm not a massive fan of that because, you know, again, life gets in the way. Life gets in the way of that. Like smart principles are not conducive to the reality of most people living. Mm. You know, we have injuries and we have difficulties and we have problems and nuances and abnormalities that happen in our life that throw us off of course. So following a strict structure like smart when inevitably life happens throws us off. So it's about generating measurable success, but rather than rather than setting these tiny little process goals that you have to stick to to this certain time frame of being so specific, I talk about challenging your identity. Mm. Like challenge your identity to fit your purpose. Like who is who is Lauren? Like you you are Paralympic Rowan. Like you embody that athlete in every single thing that you do. Mm. That is your identity. That's yeah. why you're successful. Like you can't, people don't become successful because they win every single time. They become successful because their identity is that of a winner, mm. like of an athlete. 100%. Right. So I abandoned smart, measurable success. Yeah, you should be able to see the growth in yourself in all different aspects of resilience and what that looks like to you. But if your identity is 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 ultimately going to fit your outcome, then you will make it. I remember thinking that was so like distinct from the the stuff that you taught because as athletes, all we ever get taught is smart goals, is is being really specific with your goals, be like being measurable, being like having a time frame on mm. it, and how as people we are driven towards mm. those like, sort of very specific goals. And as athletes, that's all we've ever been taught. Yeah, right. And then I remember meeting you, you were like, that's a load of garbage. Yeah, yeah. And I remember thinking at the time, like, what this guy like is meant to be teaching like hardcore psychology. And I, I remember thinking at the time, well, why is it? And then I, I remember you explaining it through in this 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 process right, of yeah. mind and, and teaching it. And it really comes to understand that sense of identity and what you talk about is completely yeah. who we are as athletes. Yeah. And I guess that's how you what you guys experience as well being it's, in the army. It's exactly so that's like the the golden example of identity being better than smart mm. is in the army. You turn up, they shave your head, they give you new clothes, they tell you how to walk, how to talk, how to make your bed, they teach you how to wash, they teach you how to clean your teeth, everything. Yeah. Like you only speak with people who speak the same way as you. It's a way of life. Right. Yeah. Everything about you is changed. Everything mm. about you. The people who are most likely to be successful are the ones who are effectively most radicalized, which mm. then ties directly into why the army recruits from a very low socioeconomic demographic. Why do we want children like me, yeah. lost kids who don't have a sense of purpose, identity or tribe? Because mm. those people, those poor kids are not more resilient. Those poor kids are more vulnerable and mm. therefore easier to radicalize. It's easier for them to change their identity. Mm, it's much easier for that. Right. We have young lads when they come to the regiment or when they, they join the army and they, they want to be in the town. So they're from Colchester. So they're joining the airborne because they want to be back in Colchester, back close to home. Those kids have got the lowest pass rate of all of them wow. because they're not, they're trying to stay close. They've joined yeah. the army, but they want to stay close to yeah. home. So actually, like based upon that identity and that ability to challenge the army and the army's processes, they're far less likely to be successful. Mm. But kids who are like, I don't really have a home, you know, I don't have a good relationship with my parents. Those are the ones who are most likely to be 
radicalize and adopt that identity. Now, that's quite an extreme example, but it's the golden example of rather than setting smart, mm. challenge your, your identity, which then leads into the I of the M-I-N-D, which is that intrinsic motivation. Because if we rely on anything external to us to control our future, then we are a slave to that. Mm. Now, if you believe that something is going to happen for you because you've put it out to the universal, because you believe it will happen to you, actually, when that gets taken away, that's a real problem. Mm. There was an amazing study done. Um, it was Yom Kippur, so the Arab-Israeli war. And there was a huge amount of psychological injuries on the battlefield, um, far higher than physical injuries on the battlefield, which is really interesting. Um, so we kind of call it like an acute stress reaction, but like a combat stress reaction. So there's combat stress reaction. So what we'd identify as like shell shock. And there was like huge numbers of these guys having shell shock from the Israeli side. And when they did like a qualitative assessment through interview study, they found that the vast majority of the people having combat stress reaction had a very intense and orthodox relationship with God, whilst the people far less likely to have an, a, a combat stress reaction are the people who had a far more modern approach to their religion. So they believed that they were in control of their fate, but God, yeah. God provided an element of resilience. Whilst those who believed that they were being punished by God and everything in their life was decided by a higher power, well, the moment things went really wrong, well, then they felt like they were being punished and they were helpless to it. Mm. And helplessness is one of the biggest precursors to a traumatic event that you are stripped of your ability mm. to control the situation that you are in. And when we kind of, that's again, like that's a big extreme example. When we pull that back, when you consider any time when you have been distressed because you've been injured or unable to compete or things have been taken out of your control, like control mm. is one of the biggest aspects to um, like emotional homeostasis that we see. Mm. You know, when you think like someone takes something from you or something is taken from your engine, you can't compete, you can't go to the gym, you can't do yeah. what you want to do. You have lost that element of control in your life. And but, I know I speak as athletes as well. Like I've had my fair amount of yeah. injuries in my, my career. And when I have ever been injured, it completely disrupts my life because I'm taken away from that safe place that I know and that training and that day in, day out, mm. that regular routine of what I know. And it's mm -hmm. kind of like your whole life is thrown up and then it's like, what do I do now? Right, Where yeah. do I go? Right. And it's definitely something that I know we've spoken about before through having injuries and stuff. Like, where does that, that being stripped of that sort of regularity of what you know, how does it change you? And actually, how does it make you resilient? Because the more injuries I've had, the more resilient I've become. And now when I get an injury, I'm like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, Even sure. though it does strip me of that, you know, that comfort place. Yeah. I, I'm like, great. Because yeah. that's, that's an opportunity for me to learn and grow and go forward. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you know, Basically, the two dif the differences between the two mindsets of I'm injured, everything's falling apart, mm. and I'm injured, how can I make what I've got work for me, mm. is the difference between it is what it is and it is what I choose to make it. Yeah. Like I abandon it is what it is. People are like, oh, but no, it like it is what it is. You're just you're just becoming a slave then to the situation mm. that you find yourself in. Oh, there's nothing I can do about it. It is what it is. Mm. No, it's what you choose to make it. Like you can, there are little things that you can do in your life to to improve that situation. That's where that intrinsic motivation comes in. It comes from within. It's it's within you. Mm. Like the worst situation, might well, how can I better? Tiny one percent. Like I mean, even from an athlete perspective, you know, and it's covered in such brilliant detail in Atomic Habits where he talks about the amalgamation of marginal gains. Improve everything by 1%. Mm. You can improve 100 things by 1%. You're 100% better. Yeah. What's the tiny little things that you can improve? That's, you know, that's accountability. And that's most imp important. It's not just accountability. It's empowerment. It's yeah. Empower the individual. Mm. Like, here we go. Here, what's the one thing you can improve? I'm sorry about the situation you're in. It, it's awful. But what can we do to improve it? Mm. Rather than going, it is what it is. So that's intrinsic motivation. And the N of M-I-N-D is now in the present moment mm. because this is where you know we we all overthink you know we suffer more in thought than we ever do in reality and there's loads in this and it's so interesting i mean probably the biggest one and it's something that we've obviously spoken about loads and i speak about with lots of people is is that anxiety that anxiety piece the overestimation of the likelihood of the worst thing happening being multiplied by underestimating your ability to cope with it yeah and that's that's just the anxiety equation and that's something we've worked on, I guess, before of sitting on that start line and that anxiety of what yeah. happens next. Yeah. And like the next eight minutes of my life, I either win another Paralympic gold medal and become right. the most successful athlete yeah. in this sport or my life falls apart, my yeah. career and everything I've worked for. Yeah. But it's in that moment of coming and turning, like facing inwards and going, no, I've trained for this. Uh -huh. I know I can do it. And yeah, it's that sure. anxiety that 
that overrides that part of your brain that we talk about and, right, and yeah. it's and it's overriding that it's yeah. going no you've worked for this you trained for this you know what this feels like yeah for sure you're just in a different situation different scenario with the pressure on it yeah, so it's yeah. learning to cope with that isn't yeah. it yeah yeah absolutely and that that coping what we're talking about here is what you're feeling in your body is your body's response to cortisol so your amygdala and your hippocampus your hippocampus being your emotional memory bank and your your amygdala being your fear generator essentially it scans everything that we have in our life everything we experience it scans everything for threat or danger so you getting all this threat or danger so there's a release of cortisol which stimulates your nervous system into a fear response which is your pounding heart rate your butterflies and it's all like completely explicable like say for example butterflies butterflies in your stomach is nothing more than the blood the capillaries shrinking away from your digestive system because you're like we don't need to digest food anymore lauren we need to get out of here yeah so if you can understand that this is just my brain and body's perception of fear and we take a top-down approach so we use our cognitive mind mm. to kind of suppress or at least understand accept and then suppress mm. and manage that that reaction so we turn victor frankl who said somewhere between uh, uh stress stimuli and um reaction is a space and within that space is choice and within that choice is freedom so we stay present focus on what you can control mm. what's right in front of you right now it's not a case of it it is what it is it is what i choose to make it you can mm. sit there panicking you're getting more and more worked up, which is inevitably going to interfere with your ability to perform, particularly as cortisol suppresses certain decision-making mm. parts of the brain so that we think more irrationally because emotional thinking and behavior is associated with survival. So you're just trying to survive. So hence why people think irrationally. And, and I say irrationally because it only appears irrational after the moment's gone because in the moment it feels like perfectly rational thinking. Yeah. But there's, there's no such thing as panic. Mm. Like when you when somebody does something in a, in a, what we call a moment of panic, mm. And you actually ask them why they did what they did. Nine times out of ten, they can justify it. There's quite a famous picture of um, the second tower, um, uh, 9/11 collapse, and there's a huge, awful plume of smoke on that, like truly tragic day. And it says panic in New York, and all these people are running away from this huge plume. Do you know? Do you remember yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're all running away from it, screaming. And it's, but who's panicking? That's that's normal. Like, why would you not? Yeah, run yeah. Away. it's abnormal to be not panicking. The only person who's behaving abnormally in that entire picture yeah. is the person taking the picture, <laughs> yeah. right? Like that's that's the abnormality. Yeah. Like there's no such thing as panic. So when when you're thinking emotionally mm. and someone going, you're thinking irrationally, it doesn't help because it doesn't feel like you're thinking irrationally. Mm. And you can't give somebody the advice. You have to lead them objectively to their own advice. Yeah. And that just involves calming that central nervous system, doing mm. the breathing techniques that we talk about, mm. focusing on on the tiny controllable things that you can mm. that are going to give you the best chance of success. And that's something that I've built into even like my race schedule now since we started talking about it. And we did a lot about pairing actions to then mm. when you're in that state of panic and fear right. of pairing an action to it. So now when you sit when I sit on the start line and I'm yeah. in that state of panic thinking, I'm going to maybe lose this race, what happens from this point and thinking about all these questions. Yeah. And being in that negative mindset, the first thing I'll do is I'll sit up, I'll take, do do the breathing, I'll yeah. take the deep breaths in, I'll do the breathing exercises that we spoke about, yeah. and I'll do one thing, I'll dry my blades off, my hands on the blades, I'll look up at the sky and just really deeply breathe. And yeah. the next thing I do is my mind's clear then. Yeah, yeah. It's clear. I love that. Yeah. And that that's for me, I do that every single yeah. time I'm on the start line now. And that's because of what we 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 started talking about and that yeah. that idea of what can I do right now that is yeah. going to clear my head and, and put me in the best space to focus on the job in hand? And yeah. that, for, for me, is an action. It's about doing the same routine over and over, yeah. focusing on my blades, how do they feel, me sitting up, taking air into my lungs yeah, and focusing yeah. on, right, what's the next thing I need to do? Okay, I need to wait for the, the red light, then the green light, and then we're off. Yeah. And then, then I'm in my job. Yeah, and yeah. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm in my safe place then. Yeah. But before that moment, you're in that state of panic, your state of fear. Yeah. And so I think pairing that now with with actions mm. every time i feel that there's that part that overrides my brain i go right sit up take yeah. deep some deep breaths yeah yeah four seconds in four seconds out do yeah. all of that yeah been doing all of that ever since we started working together oh, and it's, it's something yeah. that you know using my paralympic final in tokyo when i was in the most high pressure situation i've ever been in my life and i think those abilities just to be able to override those moments of panic yeah. is when you really start to be able to work with your brain yeah, and yeah. realize how powerful it is as yeah, well. Yeah. yeah, I cried a bit, you know, when I watched you. <laughs> yeah, there's a little website. I'm so proud of her. Like, she's a legend. <laughs> People are like, what's out of you? You don't know her. I know her. This, <laughs> yeah. is, a, this is a big deal, guys. Oh, mate, that was amazing, that race. It was amazing. And, and, and like, that's such a, you know, a beautiful thing, you know, and, and to the whole point of me doing this was, you know, make a difference to one person like what's mm. the one thing that you can do um 
which leads me on to the, the D of M-I-N-D, which is, which is dream big, right? Mm. If you can dream, dream big. And mm. if you can dream big, dream a bit bigger. Mm. Like if we condition ourselves so much to believe that like we're not capable, mm. but we are capable. Mm. And this goes back like thousands of years. Like I, 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 one of my favorite examples of this is in Greek mythology. We talk about Icarus, mm. right? So Icarus and his father, uh, Dondeleus, Dondeleus, um, were captured by King Minos of Greece. And they were put in this tower, locked in this tower and said, you've got to invent for me. You've got to build stuff for me. I'm going to kill you. I'm mm. going to kill your son. Then I'm going to kill you. So you've got to make this stuff. So what Don Lass and, and Icarus did was catch birds and just one feather at a time mm. using hot wax would, would glue them to these wooden frames and made these wings. Mm. And they jumped from their window to escape this tyrant and they flew. And Icarus flew too close to the sun and the wax melted and he fell. And all the people of Crete looked up and saw him plummet to the earth and went, oh, well, there we go. Mm. You shouldn't fly. And I'm going, at least he flew, mate. Yeah. Like he fell to his death having flown too close to the sun, but you're quietly walking towards yours under the boot of a tyrant. Yeah. We missed the point of that story. The story isn't don't fly too close to the sun. The point is it's better to fly too close to the sun than it is to stay on the ground for the whole of your life. And we condition that. Yeah. That's a Greek mythological story we tell children. Mm. Don't fly too close to the sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Greek hubris, their, their version of pride, but it's not. Like, like people are so unaware of their insecurities that when somebody is doing something, people always have something negative to say about it mm. because it, it's a reflection of them. When you judge someone, you don't judge them, you define yourself. Mm. So when someone ever is saying anything negative and it's then so easy for us to then retract away from mm. it, like cowards love to see a hero fall. And so we've conditioned ourselves to like hold back, but so many people have so much potential like aristotle identified this he called it dynamis and it was actually the origins of genetic potential but in dynamis he, he identified that every single human being has got such incredible potential but most of the time we never achieve that we never truly believe we can reach it you know aristotle didn't reach his peak until he was in his 50s but we believe as, as that, that's just too old mm. and we're saying that now in our life expectancy is the double what it was back then. Mm. And yet we have this belief that like we are incapable because we condition ourselves, play it safe. And that's part of that fear generated the amygdala and the hippocampus saying, no, what we know is familiar and what is familiar is safe. Mm. So therefore we crave that because we crave survival. Mm. So don't push outside of that. Do what people have told us to stay in your lane. But I say, don't stay in your lane. Like find a lane that suits you. Cross as many lanes as you want to find where it is that you are most happiest and you most get that bigger sense of fulfillment and pursue that. Mm. Like so many people believe themselves to be incapable because somebody at some point has told them that, that but that doesn't make it true. Mm. And so, yeah, if you can dream, dream big. And if you can dream big, dream a little bit bigger. Now, I'm, so, I'm sure so many people have heard the likes of you and I, successful people with these crazy mindsets, <laughs> come and talk like this. And to you and I, it sounds so normal because mm. that's the way we have come to be, mm -hmm. develop this level of mindset. Mm -hmm. But if you're listening to this thinking, well, how do I achieve my full potential? How do I apply this to my life in a real way? Mm. Like how, what, what advice would you give to people listening out there that to apply this to their lives oh, and how wow. can they really achieve their full potential? Yeah, yeah. I mean, wow. I mean, it's so exciting. This is one of the things that I love working with individuals so much is helping people achieve and realize what their full potential is. But, you know, one of the key things to, to finding fulfillment, um, a, a really famous psychologist called Adler and his Adlerian psychology and his, what he calls fear of rejection. He identifies that the, the, the key to fulfillment is finding what you're good at and using that to benefit the world around you. So like genuinely, what are you good at? And, and you know, the, the really tragic thing, I, I think it's an awful number. It's something like two thirds of the population never find what their true talent is. Wow. That's crazy That's just cr listening to that. Right. Like, yeah. Sitting here knowing that, I, I think since I was young, I never had a fear of like, this. I, I knew I wanted to be an athlete and I was like mm. that cliche kid that always wanted to go to the Olympics, but mm. I never had a fear of that growing up as a kid. Right. So it's, it's scary that there are so many people out there, you know, living their day-to-day -day lives, never realising. Right, yeah. You know, like I'm fulfilling yeah. that. Yeah, they, like they might have been really good at painting in primary school, but then that fear of rejection mm. and or condition or lack of um, caregiver support then kind of turn them away from ever painting in secondary school. And actually they're really talented. Mm. They And by talent, we just identify talent as having a slight excess of neural connections within that very specific department. Mm. And so they've, but they never ever access that because they never have the opportunity 
to do that. And of course, there's a huge amount of variables and factors that play a role in this. Every individual is subjective and nuanced. You know, cost of living crisis means more people are working two, three jobs. Like it's just not, mm. well, you might be a very talented horse rider. <laughs> well, I don't have a horse yeah. and I couldn't afford one even. Yeah. So, so like, there's the realities of this, but it's about exploring the world around us and finding what we can do and being curious. But most importantly, having the courage to be vulnerable and curious. Like turning up to places. I've recently started BJJ. Like, and I was worried about walking into a BJJ gym. I'd never done BJJ before. Mm. I, I did a bit of boxing when I was a young private soldier in the army. But mm. aside from that, I, you know, I played rugby. Rugby yeah. was my thing. But I'm 34 and getting battered around a rugby pitch and <laughs> not being able to do anything for like the next week. You know, didn't, you know, that just wasn't the risk versus reward. So I, I still want that element of competition yeah. and that physical struggle. And so I've gotten into BJJ and now I, I like I really enjoy it. Like I really, really enjoy it. Like I find it really fulfilling being there. I've been doing it for like four months and I'm like, this is great. I love it. Yeah. This is brilliant. I'm getting choked out five <laughs> times a week by like 17 year olds <laughs> just beat, beating me yeah. up. And it's great. See them out a lot then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot. They're like, oh, I want to roll with the big guy. And I'm like, that's scary. Yeah. That's scary that you're 50 kilograms and you're like, I want to roll with him. Like, yeah. <laughs> Like, <laughs> you need that level of mental resilience yeah, to go, I want to yeah. face that guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's this thing where um, you can start pretty much like however you want. You can start standing or start on the floor. And these kids are like so good. I'm in this amazing place called the Combat Institute. And it's just, they're so amazing. And these kids are like stand there. And you can start on the floor, which means like generally speaking, you get the bigger guys to like come into you yeah, so you yeah. can wrestle them to the on top of you and yeah, like yeah. out technique them. Or you can stand and kind of brute it. And then you get like these young lads and then they stay standing. And I'm like, that's so intimidating. <laughs> what do you mean you're going to try and out brute me? I don't like it. <laughs> Stop it. Then I'm the one starting on the floor. Like, don't hurt me. Like, it's great. Like, I love it. It's so brilliant. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, you find a new passion. Mm. And that comes from that vulnerability and mm. that turning up and being vulnerable and ready being ready to be rubbish at something and mm. that's kind of like the beauty of it like finding finding your fulfillment finding what you're subjectively good at means being subjectively really bad at it yeah. and that's scary and that's intimidating and that's overwhelming because we don't like to look foolish but ultimately the only way you can get good at something is by being bad at it and there's loads and loads of science about that how the brain forms for by neuroplasticity and the appearance of new information the, the, the synaptic connections need to realign. So for them to realign, they first have to be aligned incorrectly, mm. which means you have to be wrong. Mm. But that's how you learn. You learn by new information. So it's things that you didn't know before. So what you knew was incorrect and what you now know, what you now know is correct. One thing I often love to do when I'm really kicking myself and I'm really hate being tough on myself about rowing um, is go and watch the first videos of me ever rowing in a boat. Oh, I love that. Because for me, watching those videos not yeah. only absolutely kills me because yeah. I'm just laughing at how bad I was, but also at the time of how I felt. I felt like I was great at it. Yeah. I was like, I'm doing great here. Yeah. And now I look back and I'm like, who the hell thought that you yeah. were going to be good at this? Yeah. And, you know, eight years later, I sit here, you know, double Paralympic champion, world champion, European champion. Yeah, yeah. But that was because I just had a determination that I was going to be good at it. Yeah, I was yeah. like, I enjoy this. I love the freedom of being out on the water. And I want to be better than all, all of you guys. Yeah, yeah. So I had like a determination and a competitiveness that yeah. I guess carried me into learning a new skill. Yeah. And it's carried me ever since. And I think that what I love, I guess, about what I do and what my day job is, is moving backwards for a living quickly. Yeah, yeah, essentially. yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which yeah. I never thought I'd say but it's because it's always harder than what I am yeah. and, and like no matter how good I am at it you're always going to sit there and try and perfect the perfect stroke yeah. but in reality I'm never going to get the perfect stroke right yeah so I'm spending my life trying to perfect something I'm never ever going to yeah, do yeah, but yeah. in in the pursuit of that it makes me alive and it, it really does like you talking there about the sort of how the brain works and that's how I feel every single day because I'm trying to solve a puzzle yeah. that I'm never going to solve. Yeah, yeah. And it keeps you alive. Yeah, for sure. You know, and, and that that ties directly into um, when we talk about motivation, people who um people who who love running are far more likely to to run great distances than people who just like running 10k's. Mm. Like if you love the process of what you're doing, mm. then the outcomes will come. So as we talk about identity, if that's your identity, you're far more likely to be successful because you enjoy what you're doing. It's who you are. It's what you are. You're not obsessed over an outcome because if you don't reach the outcome, it's heartbreaking. And I'm not saying that that failure isn't heartbreaking, but failure is a complicated thing because I'm not a big believer in failure. But I mean, you're right that that all of these experiences are there to teach us. And, and it's very Aristotelian what he said, 
no man walks through the same river twice for it's not the same river and you're not the same man. Mm. And every experience we... True. Right, yeah? yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You go through something, you're like... Don't come out the same person. Don't come out the same person. Yeah, yeah. If you're if you're willing to take on board new information every single time you row, every single time you play rugby, every single time you roll, every single time you pump iron, every single time you do anything, if you're willing to take on board that new information, then it's never wasted. Mm. It's like never. There is no wasted experience mm. as long as you're willing to take on board that information. As long as you're willing to be humble you know at the at the altar of knowledge and and to just be home take on board every, like i know nothing I had a conversation with someone they said what do you think to um resilience particularly in america within the lgbtq plus community that's an aspect of resilience i hadn't ever considered yeah. like i know nothing yeah like, i know nothing from that community like no, not been through those experiences right so that's a whole branch of resilience applying to a huge part of the population that i hadn't ever considered and it's you know and what we're talking about here goes back like hundreds of years like Shakespeare said that uh, um, only a fool a fool believes himself wise a fool believes himself wise but a wise man knows himself foolish like we we know nothing mm. like I know not I, I know nothing I'm just, every day I'm like oh, I never thought of that and that's that's not just something that I hadn't got to that's just something that's something so out of the box I had never thought of it mm. so what do we think to resilience within the LGBT I I'm sorry I I don't have any information on yeah. that. It's not even something that I had mm. considered. And now I'm like, well, now I've got lots of exciting reading to do. Now yeah. I've got lots and lots of learning, learning to do. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, every day is exciting, you know. And you talk about, obviously, mind and so many more things in your book. Mm. Um, Think Yourself Resilient. Yeah. I mean, what a read. Um, The pleasure I've had to read oh, a bit. Man, thank you. Um, it's just been awesome. But I want to skip to actually the end of your book because okay. there's, there's a paragraph in there that okay. spoke to me so powerfully and was mainly the reason around why I actually created this podcast was because I'll read you the quote from it. Awesome. And it's from the conclusion and it says, a person can drown in a paddling pool mm. or a person can drown in an ocean. The size of the body of water is irrelevant. What matters is that someone is drowning and needs saving. You can dive in time and time again to save them, but you must teach them how to swim so that they can save themselves. And teaching someone to swim becomes a lot easier if yourself had the chance to learn how to swim. That quote was just incredible because obviously podcast is called Head Above Water. And for me, I want to share with the world like the, the tips and advice of of how to keep your head above water in life. Mm. Like when you're going through tough times and difficult times, what is it those those one thing, maybe it's a person, maybe it's a bit of advice, maybe it's a mindset like you have mm. that has sort of kept your head above the water all the time. And, and I think that quote just embodied for me, no matter how deep that water is, sometimes, you know, it can feel like you're in the sea and you're drowning. Mm. And sometimes it feel like you're in the battling pool. Mm -hmm. Like you say, it doesn't matter at all how big that is. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the skills to learn how to deal with it, you're going to drown. Yeah. Now talk to me a little bit about that quote and I guess uh, how you sort of came to write the book a little bit, but but why that is so important for you to teach those skills to people. Well, that, that quote, I think I've said pretty much the entirety of my time delivering mental resilience, which has been, where are we now? For like five, six years. I've been saying this, that we don't don't ever compare your trauma or your situation to anybody else or where you once were. Mm. It doesn't matter. Like, you're right. Like, we're drowning. People have said, oh, you know, to me, particularly, you know, when I did the military stuff, you know, I don't have a right to be struggling with my resilience. I never served in Iraq or Afghanistan. And I go, well, that's not, that's not relevant. Mm. But that's but that's the, the message that gets portrayed. That's what gets pushed. Mm. And actually... It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the size of the body is. You're drowning, which means you're struggling with your mental health. You feel completely overwhelmed. You've lost control. And then you can go and fix someone's problems for them. But ultimately, they haven't learned how to then save themselves. You keep diving in, diving in, diving in. The best thing you can do is teach someone how to swim. So teach someone the key psychological skills and management techniques to help themselves. Mm. And that becomes a lot easier to do when you've done it rather than you've read it from textbooks or rather than you've gone to university for 10 years, you've gone through an experience mm. and then you've gone and got processed it and got academic education. Yeah, That's what's then important so that you can then process and help those individuals in that situation. And you can then use their experiences and help them understand subjectively what's going on. Mm. You talk about being relatable because you've got to be relatable and then yeah. you can teach somebody how to swim and you can say to somebody, 
well, how are you prioritizing your time? What's actually important to you? Mm. And what are we prioritizing? When people get really ill and their health fails, the last thing they're thinking about is their job. Or the last thing they're thinking about is bin day. Like all these things that like... <laughs> Recycling's str- got to go out on Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You like Exactly. And you see, you see this happen and people get more and more caught up in the spokes of it. And actually what really matters to you, right? Well, prioritize that. Prioritize mm. your time. Make a to-do list. Only put five things on that to-do list. What's going on? What's the source of this issue? Like, why why are you feeling this fear? And everything from, you know, tiny simple things from breathe and journal to like, you know, a psychopharmacology. Like, we now need to talk about mental illness and you need to go speak to a clinician yeah. who is going to help you with a diagnosis. Mm. You know, all of these, these things, you know, we're there to help each other. And I think that, I think that if you have the capability to help somebody, you now have the responsibility to help them. Mm. Even if it's a word, a chat, a five minute conversation, even if it's going out for a coffee, even if it's just speaking to them, even if it's encouraging them, Mm. like people drown in the smallest of paddling pools and need somebody to say to them, have you considered this? Have you considered this perspective? Have you looked at it from this angle? And that's like the whole purpose of therapy is you sit Mm. there and people explain what's going on and then you look at, why they're what they're feeling and why they're feeling that way what is it about this situation is instigating that that emotion that fear that desire to survive and actually how can we look at this from a different angle Mm. so that it becomes far more manageable and it's just so fascinating to see how many people can really really benefit from those positive effects of therapy Mm. and it's just such a powerful thing so yeah a person could drown in a paddling pool or a person could drown in an ocean the size of the body of water is irrelevant and there's so many great teachings in your book, James, like Think Yourself Resilient. Honestly, people, you need to go and read it and apply it to your own life circumstances and and just like applicate like the things that you teach in that book to your own life because you can do it. Yeah. And, uh, but I just wanted to ask one question and, and like all great podcasts, we have a closing tradition on this podcast. Okay. Um, and for me, it's, I want you to give one bit of advice whether it be from your book or from your life, what do you teach? Mm. Of What's the one thing that's kept your head above water throughout your life? Um, I would not be anywhere near where I am if it wasn't for my friends. Like I have got, I'm truly blessed with my, my friendship group from yourself, mm. pushing people and pushing me to, um, and I talk about them in the book, you know, these brilliant people who have, who put up with my nonsense. Your vibe attracts your tribe, yeah. Vibe attracts your tribe, you know, my my absolute nonsense that I that I put out and and difficulties and people who have said, no, finish writing the book. I don't want to do it. Well, it's bigger than you now, mm. mate. Like we're all invested, so tough. Like finish, <laughs> finish. I don't want to go to uni anymore. I don't want to do it. Tough. Yeah. Like tough, mate. Like we have we've put too much into this yeah. now. Like I'm too in my family are all invested. Like we you're doing this. Yeah. We want this master's degree. Like not you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And my friends who have like supported me, who have, you know, and I've you know, I've sat in people's houses, you know, having cups of coffee and just been like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And they've not given me advice, they've just listened to me. And then I go, Oh, I have this light bulb moment. I go, I could do this. Mm. And these people, you know, I'm just a figurehead for all of these people who have like I'm not you know, like like the royal family. I'm just a figurehead. I'm not. I don't have any. You're the real, queen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They just, they just, they're all behind me, pushing me, encouraging me. You know, putting me right. Yeah. You know, and and without them, I would be nowhere near where I am. And like, you know, I, I love them all so very much. And and I'm 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 I'm. It's like a, my talent. I think is that I'm really good at just finding truly brilliant people in my life. And I've people who I in, I'm instantly drawn to like yeah. genuinely brilliant people and um I make great friends and so yeah if my 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 advice would be um concentrate on the people who you feel most calm most authentic around mm. because those are the people you should be spending as much time as possible with that's beautiful advice mate thanks, honestly mate. like thank you for coming on, on, oh, on the thanks show thanks for having me and thanks for just such an incredible conversation like I've taken so much like <sighs> It's honestly like a voice, but also just energy away from yeah. you. And uh, I know the rest of the listeners will be just, you know, absolutely blown away by what you've said today. So thank you ever so much. Thanks so much for having me, Lauren. Like you're the best. Thank you.